little bit about a late stage. I just want to give you some ideas for some behaviors that you see. Hoarding. I think, I think if I, I have enough stuff, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to feel secure. I'm going to be comfortable. I just I don't know when that's enough. You know, and so I'm just going to keep getting stuff. If you can meet my need and let me know that I have enough stuff, then I might be okay. Maybe find a designated place where I can keep it. That might be good. Or maybe have, if it's sweet and low packets, maybe you got like a little envelope that says, please collect 10 sweet and low packets and always keep it in sight so that I know when it's full and I can sense when I'm done. So, uh, maybe have a clear container that I could put these things in or allow the hoarding but just have certain ones out that are just dedicated for this person. Uh, just kind of think of some, I mean, think of a three to five year old that has a pocket full of little toys and rocks and, you know, there, there's kind of like a need behind it. And, you know, if we, if we know what the need is, you, you may never be able to guess because they could be hoarding food, food that they never eat, but maybe they grew up in a time where they had without. And if they have all these things, maybe I feel like I'll be able to provide, I'll be safe. I know I'll have food later, you know, so, so there's all these anxieties that they may not be able to articulate to you, but if you allow a little bit of hoarding to maybe a limit, uh, to let them know when it's okay, it might be enough. Uh, sometimes it helps when you reshop to give someone a dollar and say, did you get all the stuff? Thanks. Here you go. Thanks for getting that for me. That, that's pretty helpful, but I, I should give you lots of ideas because um, sometimes they collect valuable things, like all the spoons, and that, that's kind of hard. Uh, so maybe just have a designated place with like a, a little silverware tray that could hold ten spoons and say, look, you got them all, right? That's it. Uh, so, so that's just kind of a different perspective on hoarding to, to see if uh, some way we could address that. Um, wandering. There's a number of assessment tools available for wandering. People who have a mini mental status score between a zero and 19 are at a higher likelihood for having wandering or people who have a pre-morbid lifestyle of walking, like maybe it was a postman or somebody who used to go out shopping at the mall every time they were kind of ill, at ease. Um, also people who are depressed are, are at a higher risk for wandering. But since depression is so prevalent in institutionalized settings, that, that really isn't telling you too much. But uh, other assessments you could give, the revised Algae's Wandering Scale. And I find this one's pretty comprehensive. The Wandering Outcomes Monitor, which is in the Future et al. article. You could probably buy it for 30 bucks from Wiley Interscience. I referenced that article in the back of your book. If you want to get the Wandering Outcomes Monitor, you could also email Deborah Perry Schoenfelder, and maybe she'll send it to you. I, I haven't heard from her yet. I, I keep emailing her and saying nice things, but it says it at the end of the article email her if you want more information about the Wandering Outcomes Monitor. So I don't want this to get lost in the dust. It's a very good uh, wandering monitor. There's nothing else like it. Address wandering with a multifaceted approach. Make sure your client has a secure and safe walking area and you can hang up some 3D wall art or things for the clients to touch and explore so they can have meaningful interaction with their environment. You actually see if there's stuff to touch that fog lifts from their face and they look like they're paying attention as opposed to this like aimless kind of wandering. Yes, ma'am. What about something like a rummage bin? I think a rummage bin's okay, you know, if, especially if they have a hoarding and wandering kind of behavior. I mean, a rummage bin's good because we can make sure they're small kind of items so they're not, you know, carrying blankets and stuff that could cause a fall. I like rummage bins. I also like, uh, coat racks with purses and gloves, you know, let's say you have someone who's an elopement risk. Now you just created an antecedent to elopement, something to warn you that she's getting ready to leave. You know, she'll get all dull, trussed up, and you know what you want her to do, especially in the winter, if she does accidentally get out, right? Um, so yeah, I love that. Uh, you could paint a wall mural to disguise exit, so I would include this door and maybe a landscape of the mountains and paint over the door. You could put a, if I don't see it, it's not there at that stage. It's part of why my hair is sticking up in the back. Put a little cloth over the panic bar. If they don't see it, they're not going to shake it and uh, set off an alarm if you're in an institutionalized setting. Uh, black can be seen as bugs, trenches, and holes. And I really try to avoid it with this population. But if you do have a black rug on the floor, they won't step on it. Um, I don't like to use that. It's... 
they think it's a hole. That's why they won't step on it. I would rather have a rug with a uh, verbal alarm system on it so when they step on it, you could record something on it like, oh, turn around, there's ice cream in the freezer. You know, so, so they have something to redirect. And research shows that verbal alarm systems are more effective than aversive alarm systems. If it's aversive, they're going to try to shut it off and they're more likely to fall, you know, in an attempt to do so. You also put up signs around the environment to encourage kind of a scavenger hunt kind of thing. So maybe near the rummage bin, I put a little sign that says rummage bin, take one or something to help them notice and interact. Or maybe at the exit door, have a sign that says, sorry, we're closed. And then have right next to there a chair that says, sit down. You know, so when they walk to the door, they go, oh, they're never open when I get here. And then they sit down and take a rest. And then maybe next to the chair, it says, rummage bin, this way, go pick one. You know, something to make them meaningfully interact with their environment. And I just put in a strategic rest break. If you're aware of people's wandering paths, and follow them around a little bit, it's, it's easier to do these kinds of things for them. Uh, if they are an elopement risk, then you probably want to put on some sort of mobile locator device. If they're in a home with their family, they, they do have kind of like uh, low jacks for people. Uh, you also have the wander guard system for institutionalized settings, those white anklets with the just the clients hate those. You have ones that can be disguised as watches, bracelets, and belt buckles. Go online and look at the Alzheimer's store. They, they sell them there. Also, uh, some physical and psychosocial interventions for wandering. Assess and treat depression through active <coughs> engagement. That's, that's really the only non-farm intervention I have for you. Give them chances to go outside, get vitamin D, natural lighting meaningful interactions. Use social cues during activities to encourage people to stay. I'm glad you came. Heavy pressure, heavy pressure on the shoulder, rub the back. I'm always glad to see you. Just something to keep them there and keep reminding them that they are present and they are noticed. Have music sessions rather than reading sessions. People stay longer at the stage to music rather than the reading. And make sure we get enough supervision. Don't, I mean, encourage walking. Don't, don't limit walking unnecessarily. I, I know in the institutionalized setting, a lot of people get discharged on a chair alarm because we're really on the fence. And you know, how many people can you be on the fence for? He keeps transferring himself to the bathroom five times a day. Maybe we should just cut the cord and say, all right then, that's fine. Falls are a natural part of aging. Anyway. Just another idea. And eliminate stressors that would trigger people to want to keep getting up, like cold temperature, too many visitors, a stressful kind of interaction. Avoid that. Provide regular exercise. And uh, if, if someone has like a hip fracture and they keep trying to get up out of a chair and try to stand, 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 teach them how to wander with their wheelchair. If you meet their need, they won't keep trying to get up. So instead of saying sit down, sit down, sit down, say these are your wheels. You could move by pushing your wheels. And you probably have to have three 60-minute sessions on that and make sure the caregiver is encouraging it. But it, it will address their need, and they're less likely to try to get up and hurt themselves. Otherwise, you get convinced to put them in this dual axle at a tilt back, kind of, and it, it doesn't help. They still try to get, get up. So sit up, meet their need, which is to wander, and then go through this whole model to see why they're wandering so that we can address the issue. Is it always to the bathroom? Is it always to the exit? That'll help us understand the need driving the behavior. I told you about yelling, uh, some Tylenol. Uh, just a little bit of Tylenol seemed to be reducing the yelling. But since this is a non-farm class, pain management. Make sure their chair is comfortable. Make sure we are repositioning them on a frequent basis. I know in the institution we say every two hours. But a pressure sore starts to build after a half an hour. Uh, make sure we have some good pressure relieving cushions. Broda is a pretty good chair at this stage, uh, easy to clean. Uh, B-R-O-D-A, bless you. It is a, a chair that someone could age in. Also, music reduces mu uh, verbal disruption. So giving someone a headset, listening to classical music, delayed feedback headphones, like you would give someone who stutters, that, that also seems to help. 
Another option is give them gum, if that's appropriate. They'll be focusing on that psychomotor activity, less likely to yell. So a couple of things that you might want to trial. If you say yeah right to all of them, well, it's a brainstorm. You don't kill anything in a brainstorm. You just take it and just kind of go from there. So see what works, what might not work. But those are some ideas. But I just want to let you know, help me, help me, help me started as a whisper. All right, uh, some ideas for eating difficulties. Simplify the setup. If you serve trays, they're not going to eat any of that. She's just going to go and grab pie. That's what, with her hands. I don't see utensils. They're not there. I don't see my food. It's not there. Suddenly, she's feeding herself when you simplify the setup, and she only eats off the right side of the plate. What do I do? When she's done with the right side of the plate, you turn it, and you know common sense isn't common anymore. This is a skilled service that you provide, and you train the caregiver how to do it. It's a various caregiver's goal. I say with various caregivers, caregiver says, I got 30 people to feed. I can't go giving her a special kind of setup, right? Everyone just gets their tray. And they go, well, you know what? How about I delay her tray to be last? Could you do it then? She goes, yeah, if it's last, sure, I'll have time because I'm done. You set it up. She does it. Next week she goes, you know that thing that you had me do for her? I had another patient who had trouble eating, and I did the same setup with her. And you know what? She's feeding herself. And I go, that's a good idea that you had. Okay? You're really good with these people. Because sometimes we just close the accordion because we've got so much to do that we don't notice all these little things. Yes, ma'am? I heard in some places they take uh, portable uh, uh, carts around to people at the table, let them pick the table. That might be an alternative. She said some places they take an a la carte and have people pick what's off the cart and just put it on the table themselves. Yes, yeah, so it's successful. Eat an alternative. People do eat more. And also family style, having people at the table, helping themselves. Yeah. Yeah, if you have a dedicated unit. People are like, infection control. Oh, like, if infection control goes to a dementia unit, you know, lice, head lice spreads very quickly. And so, I mean, because we're all hugging and kissing each other because they don't know what's going on. And, you know, so we got to be very careful. But, yeah, the family style, people are eating more and... Uh, people are like, this is the funny thing. We're always like, well, we got to follow infection control. This person has C. diff, this person has C. diff, and they like all gown up and put on all their stuff and take care of the patient. And then they bring the gate belt from that room to the next room to work on the next person. I wonder why everyone keeps getting C. diff. Yeah. I had a patient, she comes up to me, and uh, she, they, she was, like, has her breakfast, like it falls in her lap when she's eating. She's like, mm -hmm, like all like her eggs fall on her lap. And I go up to her, and uh, I go, is this, is this the midnight snack? I'm like, and my coworker, she goes, so OT, she's like horrified. She goes, oh, did you just eat that off of her lap? I'm like, yeah. And I don't know why I keep getting C. diff. <laughs> just kidding. I wouldn't eat food out of someone's lap. I'm just... <laughs> I'm just joking with her, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, routine seating. Uh, sitting with the same people all the time seems to increase the amount of food that people eat too. So sitting with peers, that's a good thing. Uh, even better, better uh, your suggestion, sit people of like cognition together so that way we can just have a certain care plan for that group if you do a common dining area. Uh, finger foods. Uh, food in bowls can be included in a finger food diet, so soup is a finger food. Most people understand spoon to mouth and hand to mouth, so that should broaden your diet options. Uh, classical music uh, made people eat more. The color red made people drink up to 80% more and eat up to 24% more. So you could do so you could do red tablecloth or a red splash wall. They do sell red lip plates. I limit adapted utensils because the client usually doesn't know how to use them, and, and the new learning's difficult, especially angled utensils. They're just always pointing the wrong way. But I do like lip plates because it, it does keep the food on the plate. That doesn't seem to interrupt the dynamic. 
Um, modeling is you eating in front of a person. They might be more likely to eat. The other option is oral stimulation before a meal. That could reduce spitting behavior. It could reduce pocketing, and it might increase PO intake and decrease that tongue thrust. A real quick oral stim before a meal would have someone to feed themselves some uh, Italian ice, some lemon Italian ice. It's, it's cold, which is a noxious stim. It's bitter, and it's sweet. So that, that might work. And another option is if they're, they don't eat a lot, you could give them small portions just you know, blatantly exploit their memory loss by having lunch five times in a row. You know, you give them a little plate, let them eat a bit, and then when they're done, you know, wait for them to forget your interaction and come back and do it again and again and again. Uh, in this stage, it's about a one to three minute short-term memory and working memory. Sleep disturbance, best non-farm intervention is to keep them busy all day with stuff to do. Then they're less likely to stay up all night. But if, if they did end up staying up all night, just wake them up at the same time every day, no matter what. If you have enough staff and this person is a night person, why not just let them stay up? But we just want the routine's important, so you want them to have a regular pattern, whatever you decide to do. And 24-hour behavior observation is like you can go in Excel and just plug in all 24 hours of the day, all seven days of the week. And if we have a client who does kind of a quirky behavior and we don't know when or how often, this is just a way to kind of check off instances. You can also take um, a bowel and bladder observation form, just cross it out, write behavior form. All right, combativeness. You will want to assess for depression, agitation, passivity, a past leisure interest, because that might be one way to intervene to stop the aggression. Uh, what's their current cognition, and what time of day does it happen? There are some standardized assessments for that, too, including the Cohen-Mansfield Agitation Inventory and the Passivity with Dementia Scale, uh, which are referenced in the back of your book. Interventions that seem to work for agitation. Uh, these are kind of preventative measures. Sleeping on an air mattress, uh, that's what air mat therapy is. And I, I think they started to see a, a reduction in agitation uh, within a week. There's something about, it could be the white noise of the air compressor, and it could be the decreasing the pain with the air mattress. And uh, lots of activities throughout the day to address their passive states should help with the agitation. Now, as for the moment, if someone is agitated in the moment, um, I, told, I told you sometimes they tell you exactly what they're going to do to you. Uh, sometimes they brood, like they just make like this kind of face, and I told you that. Uh, short, yes, no answers. Uh, now, if they're doing all of those things, what you want to do is, is talk in a calm, clear voice and use simple terms to explain what you're trying to say. You want your staggered stance and, and always be near the door in case something happens. And you, you also want to make sure your body language matches your facial expression. So I'm just here to help. I could leave if you want me to. But this calm kind of voice, Nobody wants to argue with that. Like, it just, anger's hungry. I'm not giving it anything. They just finally will say, it's not worth it. I'm not going to do it. Now, if you argue, correct, convince while someone's agitated, that's what happens. We just don't want to add to it. Best way to prevent falls is to keep people busy with activities. But also to prevent falls, remove clutter and provide extra exercise. Uh, there are these things called hipsters, which if you're going to Google it, don't write hipster because you won't find what you're looking for. See disgruntled 20-year-olds that are wearing plaid. Uh, so, but you'll see um, hip protector. Uh, the research was showing people who wear hip protectors, this padding over their greater trochanter area, uh, they're less likely to fracture a hip if they fall. It's a bumper. 
I, I don't know why it works. It just works. And uh, just order two. So when one's in the laundry, they always have one available. Compliment your client on their curves. Another thing, uh, you can get a colored cannula. So they're less likely to trip over it. Uh, just look at your medical supplier. They do have different colors available that might stand out a little better against backdrops. Uh, that light blue, like I said, contrasts with everything. I might accept black in this kind of situation. It's so thin that they, they might, you know, they'll notice it uh, and, and maybe they'll be able to pick it up. So there's, there's some ideas for fall prevention. Perseveration. Uh, I don't know when to stop, so you'll have to tell me when. Just watch my motor loops. So let's say I'm brushing my teeth. Good job! And then you go give me the next thing to perseverate on. When do you say it? You try. Thank you. Oh, okay then, okay. And it's hard to guess because sometimes people do it so very quickly, so you might have to trial and error that. But all they need is some sort of sense of completion, like a compliment or stop or next or whatever. Uh, if they keep stripping, uh, you could uh, get clothing that fastens in the back, but just know that it's a restraint. Uh, you could buy looser clothing if people keep fidgeting with undergarments. Uh, you could pre-measure item quantities. That lady who goes Broadway overboard with makeup, buy, buy her lighter shades of makeup. I told you sundowning, it just happens at the same time any, every day. So it doesn't matter what the behavior is. It's any behavior that we went over today. It just happens at the same time every day. If it happens at the same time, then you know what to prevent. And, and the goal would be client will participate in a healthy leisure task between this time and this time to prevent the sundowning behavior. Any questions before I go on to anything? To end stage. Okay, end stage expectations include anything you'd expect a zero to six month old. So we, we try to get the client to walk for as long as we can. I uh, try to get them to stand up from higher levels, like maybe get a higher chair to decrease the motor demand and try to get them to walk. Maybe take off their shoes, give them slipper socks to see if they get better proprioceptive input and maybe they'll walk after that. Uh, Maybe we try to give them deep joint compressions to improve their body awareness and see if we could get them to walk. But then there's just one point in time when we know they're about to transition to go to the next stage. And in this stage, we call them bed bound. We see rigidity, varying alertness, literally taping people back together and talking about hospice. You know, please start a grieving program where you work. I don't know if you have one. But you, you could just have a basket where we write little things about people that we think about and that we work with and just kind of put it in the basket. That, that could be your grieving program. Just do something uh, because it would make their life tangible and, and you won't feel, you, you have to deal with your loss too. You lose people all the time. But let's talk about some stuff to do at end stage. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about sensory processing and then uh, meaningful activities for bed patients, Rigidity, a little bit on pain, and some sensory stim techniques that are all non-farm to include your increase your client's alertness levels because maybe they're not waking up to eat something or we, we need to wash them up or have them take a pain pill or something. All right, uh, because of the delay in sensory processing, get, until you know your client better, please give them at least 60 seconds to process a cue. And because of hippocampal damage, they might forget what the cue is by the time you set it. So repeat yourself. And this works at all stages. If it doesn't work, you could always alter the cue. And if that doesn't work, 
use a multi-sensory cue, kind of tell them with uh, tactile cues, gestural cues, visual cues. Sensory deprivation is a loss of meaningful input, which may occur in a sterile environment, uh, also because the client has abolition and they're not seeking out activities. Sensory deprivation can cause a faster progression of dementia, depression, irritability, and confusion. Uh, gating is the time needed to process sensory information. So, so your clients do have a gating delay. If you do not give them time to process in, a, in their gating time, uh, they will process at midbrain level and you'll get fight or flight or shut down. So if you're getting any of those, it, it's probably because you didn't wait long enough for them to process. Threshold is the amount of input that you need to process the input. So some people don't need more time, they just need a richer cue. And that's, that's the person who says, don't yell, I'm not deaf, we probably needed to change how we said it, or maybe change our tone of voice, use your phone voice. You know, because sometimes when you yell, your, your voice gets a higher pitch and, and they can't hear you. All right. I have a listing of ways that you could stimulate the senses for bed patients. Gustatory, uh, proprioception, tactile, olfactory, auditory, visual, and vestibular. Uh, the only one I want to say something particular about with vestibular is stick to lateral movements, like up, down on a hospital bed, or sitting them up next to you on the edge of the bed or rocking in a rocking chair, and, and watch for nystagmus because they might be very sensitive to vestibular. If you don't have a lot of money, uh, you can make a sensory box. Just find found objects that have different textures and glue them to a box. In this case, I had Dyson, Velcro, box tape, and I, I could always find Mardi Gras beads wherever I work. I don't know why. Uh, but you know, I just glued them all to a box and made this kind of interactive Thing. In, inside there's bubble wrap and a block with like sandpaper. Uh, these are different things that a client could explore maybe before a meal to increase their alertness. You can make your own. Uh, this is the award-winning multi-sensory environment from the Hong Kong Society of the Blind. Uh, people who are blind and have dementia really benefit from sensory interventions despite their level of dementia. We actually see improvements in cognitive scores if you do multi-sensory activities with them. Uh, so meaningful activities for bed patients include meals, family visits. They, they still recognize familiar faces and voices until the very end of their life. Uh, we've had people who look like they're just we have people that we assume they're vegetables, and you, you put a PET scan helmet on this person and you show them pictures of random strangers mixed with family members. When they see family members, the whole brain lights up. And that just tells us, you know, we've been severely underestimating what people are capable of for processing. Uh, so, uh, you know, explain to your client what you're doing before, during, and after all care because they may be way more aware than we think they are. I mean, think of those patients who had a stroke and they told you their stories about people who were talking around them, like they didn't know what was going on, but they did. So we, we don't want to underestimate. Rigidity. Uh, so, so the clients are at risk for getting contracted into the fetal position, and, and this is because of kind of a reflexive type of tone that they would develop in the end stage of dementia. The, the best way to stretch that out is a long, slow stretch. And uh, it, when you stretch, you'll feel like this really tight area, and it almost feels like they're fighting you. And if you wait, you'll see the muscle bellies relax. They'll just kind of flick, 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 and then they'll relax. And you could go a little bit further. Uh, some people take longer to do than others, but usually I could find that I could do a full stretch and then you hold the, the client in that position, externally rotated, for about 30 seconds, and they're loose. So don't do 10 reps of passive range of motion for the upper and lower extremity. 
twice a day, because you're probably going to facilitate a contracture getting the reflexive response, it's better to just do the long, slow stretch and hold it. And then tell the lay caregiver, how would you like to save some time? You know, just sell it to them, because it's the number one skipped out care by lay caregivers. So if we tell them that this is actually a big time saver uh, and it will help with the ADL for someone who's a total assist uh, to get them nice and loose. Use the Wong Baker uh, pain assessment, W-O-N-G hyphen B-A-K-E-R. It's a facial scale. Uh, for clients that are nonverbal, there we go. You've probably seen it before. Have you seen it before? Yeah. Uh, so there's a number of correlations to that if the client's not able to articulate that they're having pain. And then you want to look for some nonverbal indicators that they may be in pain. And they might not know it hurts until five minutes after you did the aversive procedure. Uh, watch your tone of voice. Uh, if you sing, they, they feel less pain. If, you, if we do a distracting kind of activity during the aversive procedure, like joint mobility or whatnot, they will also feel less pain. Uh, here's some non-farm sensory stim techniques, and then we'll say goodbye. Um, brushing, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Wilbarger brushing protocol for kids, but it also works for grown-ups. Uh, you could just go to a gourmet food store, get a corn silk brush, and brush over the client's clothing like this, across their chest, and if I already said this, I'm sorry, I have dementia. Go across their back, their legs, their hands, and their feet. Don't do their stomach because they, they might get indigestion, they might be too sensitive there. Uh, follow with deep joint compressions uh, because you don't want to overstimulate and agitate someone. The deep joint compressions will actually calm them down when they're done. Uh, so what you do is you're going to grab both sides of a joint and push them into each other. One to three pounds of pressure or I could stabilize and go like that. You could go all the way up to hips, shoulders, and arms. Uh, oral stim. I just do five. I usually wear gloves because they start to drool. All right. If they need a higher threshold of input, you could always use a massager or cover an electric razor. Uh, if they have a gag reflex, you'll have to stop, tone it down, whatever you're doing. Uh, maybe it'll take to you putting a lemon glycerin swab in their cheeks, in the front of their tongue, I, I did write down how to do deep joint compressions here. Uh, there's noxious stim, which you should only use in an emergency. Uh, if we need someone to wake up who is just totally uh, non-responsive, we called their name, we tried everything else. Uh, these are kind of volatile and some ways to wake people up. You could put some clove oil on their tongue. Lavender uh, brings people up or down. But I just heard yesterday that is the uh, fragrance of forgetting. Lavender. Lavender. Yeah, there's another, there's another specialist that uh, he, said, he said that, uh, and then he said citrus is the one for remembering. Well, I mean, citrus I know brings people up, but lavender brings people up or down. I, I don't know, that's interesting. Uh, bitter apple is something that the client can smell. Uh, it's the most pungent smell uh, that the clients can process. Light touch, cold, uh, sternal pressure is about one to three pounds of pressure right on the sternum. Don't go for a rub. Remember, skin integrity issues. There's a gentle way to do it. Uh, if someone is not alert at all, you could stimulate the senses in order of complexity. And this is the order. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a theme or anything, but if someone's just non-responsive, you might have them smell something, Give them about 60 seconds to respond, then move on to the next thing, visual. Uh, if, they're, if they're not responsive, maybe you could do a flashlight 
to their closed eyes. Tactile, uh, open hand touch, proprioception could be range, or deep joint compressions if they haven't opened their eyes yet. Vestibular, try to sit them up, you know, move their posture, move their head somehow. Auditory, sing a song, sing it twice. And then gustatory, some sort of taste. And, and that should wake them up. It, it's kind of like giving them a Red Bull. It, it lasts for about, could last for an hour, maybe two tops. Thanks for coming today. I hope you have a lot of good ideas. Good luck. Uh, don't forget to fill out your vow uh, and sign out before you leave. I'm sticking around uh, because some people still wanted to buy stuff, so I'll still be around. Yeah, put your ashes in the same pile. Yep. <laughs>